So I, I want to say good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. And uh, especially today, I want to say uh, good evening or good night to our speaker, to our esteemed colleague, Colin Camprani, that is with us from uh, Australia. And also I want to say uh, good afternoon to my co-moderator today, uh, Mate Kuzar from uh, Slovenia. And uh, it is a pleasure to be with you after all these uh, good moments that we were together in, in, in the coast. And uh, also I want to acknowledge our associated partners. I want to acknowledge University of Minho and ISIS for providing the necessary tools for making these talks possible. I want to acknowledge FIB and IABSE for the dissemination activities. And I want to acknowledge the boutique for all the design stuff. Um, some information for you. The first one is that we are running in parallel to this talk a survey on how we are uh, adapting or what measures are we developing for critical infrastructures worldwide in this pandemic time. So we are collecting at Eurostract data from all kinds of measures and so on from these different critical infrastructures. So if you have the opportunity to fill in the, the the questionnaire while we are in this talk, that would be great. The second point that I want to, to, to tell you is about the process of making questions. Uh, for those that are assisting us on Facebook, you can put your questions on the Facebook message in the live talk. For those that are here with us in a Zoom chat, you can put your questions to the Eurostruct Association account. And then myself and Mate, we are going to receive your question and we are going to put these questions to our esteemed speaker today, Colin Caprani. So I wish you all a very nice uh, talk, a very nice event and active, uh, raising a topic that uh, nowadays is a big topic and uh, that was still not raised here which is connected with the loadings. And now I'm going to ask Mate to make the presentation of our speaker today and of the topic. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you, Jose. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, it's a pleasure for me to introduce someone who is a professor and a practicing engineer at the same time. And this is Professor Colin Caprani. He's a structural engineer, and a fellow of Engineers Australia with considerable industrial and academic experience. His work specializes on the safety assessment and performance monitoring of bridges. He's also a director of the nonprofit Confidential Reporting of Structural Safety Australasia. Now, he has supervised many PhD and master students in a variety of topics related to structural safety and bridge engineering. He has received many awards, lectured in three different universities, and also attracted significant research funding. He is also a prominent media contributor on bridge and structural safety issues. So this was a short introduction of our speaker, Professor Caprani, the Zoom is yours. Thank you, Matei, and thank you, Jose, for the invitation. Um, I'm delighted to talk about uh, loading on, on bridges, uh, an area I've been working in for uh, over 20 years, and it's uh, not been an attractive area for some time, but I think it's the importance is becoming increasingly recognized as we look for uh, extra space where we can make a better assessment of existing bridges. Um, so the talk is, um, just let me get my focus there, yeah. Uh, so the talk is, is just a little bit mixing Australian practice uh, with some general approaches that will work uh, in Europe or, or indeed anywhere. Um, but I thought it, the audience might be interested in, in what is uh, different and unique about Australia. 
Um, so I'll introduce a little bit on our uh, vehicle types here and uh, the bridge types that we have in Australia. Uh, and on this slide is a, a famous bridge in Melbourne called the Westgate Bridge, uh, which is uh, one of, of two uh, cable stay bridges that were built in the late 60s uh, or early 70s. Um, the other sister bridge of this is the Erskine Bridge in Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, it, was, it was a, a particular design at, at that point in time. So Australia, just to put it in context, is a very big continent. It's a very big country. Uh, as you can see, uh, we, can, we can squish Europe in here. So um, moving freight around Australia is uh, a lot done by road uh, because of the vast distances that are involved. So looking at the freight map uh, around Australia, although rail carries more um, ton kilometers than road, uh, if you'll notice here, uh, a lot of this is to do with the mining in Western Australia. And once you take out 56% of the rail freight off that number, you can see that the majority of all the freight in Australia is carried on the road. Um, one of the main routes uh, is, is this one here, which is uh, between Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, Sydney has a, a port and Melbourne has a port uh, and a lot of it um, transfers between these two uh, cities. Um, Brisbane is another capital city and Adelaide uh, another capital city where we have this eastern coast uh, main freight routes. So road freight is incredibly important to Australia and the truck fleet represents that or reflects that. So we have the, the semi-trailers, uh, five and six axle semi-trailers common uh, in Europe um, but less common in Europe I think um, but, but increasingly so are what we call B-doubles. Uh, B is the name of the, uh, the coupling uh, that, that exists between the two um, units of the vehicle here when, it's, uh, when, when, the, when the, vehicle, the trailer at the back is resting on the, the front trailer, it's known as a B coupling. Um, and that's what we have here. Uh, this is also a B couple, but we have four axles here so we can take uh, more load on this. So this is known as a quad quad B double because we've got four axles at the back, four axles here in the interim. Uh, we've got our two axles under the kingpin and our steer axle here. Uh, so this quad quad B-double can move two 40-foot containers and they're pretty common around uh, port areas. Uh, the quad quad B-doubles can be up to 110 tonnes, um, but they are typically about 78.5 tonnes, I think. But you might be more familiar with some of the TV programmes that show uh, that Australia has uh, road trains. And these road trains um, very much exist and they're a, an essential part of uh, long distance freight in many of the uh, uh, states, in particular in Queensland, um, Western Australia, um, where we have the, this type of coupling here, which is it's probably easier to see here, and this is known as an A coupling uh, as opposed to a B coupling. So this way the, the road trains are modular and they can be uh, connected together and continue to be connected together. Uh, so again, the, uh, we've got a triaxle group here and a, a, a tandem group here, uh, and that's pretty common, and, and of course that road train can continue. So this is the, the type of vehicles that we're thinking about when we're thinking about our bridges in Australia. So if we think about Australia bridges, I've introduced the Westgate Bridge, which is our uh, home bridge here in Melbourne. Um, you're probably familiar with the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which is where the uh, fireworks happen each year. Uh, New Year's Eve, you might have seen those videos. Um, but we have some other pretty pretty amazing bridges as well. Um, this is the Seacliff Bridge, um, which is uh, built out from the face of this crumbling uh, cliff face here, which the, the existing road is, is along here, but um, there was substantial uh, rock falls onto the road, so uh, this bridge was built out. It's an incredible uh, bridge, and, and uh, this section here in particular was push launched um, on, on, a, on, a, on a curve. It's it, it really a, a tremendous design. Uh, and then a significant cable stay bridge uh, in Sydney as well, known as the Anzac Bridge. Um, and uh, this one has some structural health monitoring systems on as well. These are our iconic bridges, but like most countries, of course, um, we don't just have iconic bridges. In fact, the iconic bridges make up a very small percentage of our stock. Instead, our bridge stock is uh, made up a lot more of these uh, pre-stressed concrete eye girders, uh, which look a bit like this. Um, these will have been built in the early 70s typically, 
Uh, we've got reinforced concrete plank bridges, uh, which can look like this. You can see we've got some uh, transverse um, post-tensioning, perhaps uh, uh, across, uh, across the width, trying to increase the lateral distribution of load. Uh, we have some steel girders, quite typical. In very rural uh, areas, we'll have these old timber bridges. And then we have uh, a lot of uh, truss bridges. They can be uh, timber or steel uh, truss bridges as well. So there's quite a mix of, of bridge stock uh, that we have in Australia to, to be concerned with. And what's interesting is each of the bridge types, like most countries, tended to be designed around a particular era. Uh, so that means that if problems emerge with that bridge uh, type, all of the bridges you know, built around that time may have a similar problem. Now, one thing that's I found quite uh, unique about Australia um, compared to uh, Europe when, when I uh, was working in Europe is the very clear differences in road network classifications. Now, the ordinary road will always be this general mass limit, which is our, our typical semi-trailer truck. But a lot of the road network, uh, the motorway network in particular, will be known as a HML network, a higher mass limit network. And these HML routes uh, were introduced in the late 90s in order to try to increase the road freight productivity in Australia. And it's particularly important for bridges because all bridges on that route, of course, must then be checked for this HML configuration that's permissible on that route. And these road network classifications are uh, publicly available. Uh, you can go to uh, the Road State Authority's website and if you're a freight operator, you can you know, look at the map and, just, and, and pick your route based on uh, the uh, GIS information of what that route is categorized as. So the HML network, and then we have what are known as the HPFE. These are the high performance freight vehicle routes. So this uh, example here is a 77.5 ton quad quad B double. Uh, and so this of course is a, a smaller network than the HML network, which is a smaller network than the GML network. But the uh, way that the road network is broken up, I've found quite interesting uh, in Australia, quite, quite unique. Uh, these are the main three, but there are many, many more, um, in particular relating to over-dimension routes, um, over-mass routes, uh, special crane routes, uh, and so on. So the road network classification um, is, is something that uh, I'm not quite sure is, is as open in Europe as, as it is here in Australia. So the motivation, um, if you're, you're not already kind of clear on, on, on the purpose here is that uh, is, is we have an aging bridge stock. This is uh, an approximate histogram of the bridge age in Victoria. Uh, our knowledge is not perfect, of course. Um, sometimes the documents are lost uh, in archives. Uh, other times the bridge was never documented. So we, we, do, we do have some unknowns, but in, in the main, you can see uh, the issue here that we've got a, a lot of bridges in this period here, which are uh, 40 to 55 years old, uh, and, and that's today. And of course, what's happening with this histogram is this histogram is shifting backwards in time, right? Because as, as time goes on, these bridges are getting older and older. Um, now, sometimes people say, well, is it a problem if bridges are getting older? Well, you know, not. It's not inherently a problem, but we do know that the age of a bridge is well correlated with a reducing capacity to take load. In other words, as, as bridges age, uh, they're un increasingly uh, unfit for purpose. So I've got some evidence for this. Um, so this is an interesting study, um, uh, Wang et al in 2011. And this is from the United States, from Georgia and their bridge management system. What's interesting here is that they have a fairly uniform distribution of, of bridges uh, across time. So they weren't really building more bridges at any point in time. They, they were building about as many bridges uh, across time, you know, a reasonably straightforward uh, or flat uh, distribution here. But if you then separate out of these 9,000 bridges, the bridges that are posted, that is the bridges that have a load limit on them, 
you can begin to see that the posted bridges um, have, have, are very skewed, right, in, in, in age. So the older the bridge is, the more likely it is to be uh, posted. Now, a posted bridge is a problem for freight operators because it means that the originally intended load can no longer be carried or that the uh, legal limit now uh, is not allowed to be carried on that bridge. That might be because the bridge was designed for a lower limit, or it might be because the bridge is degrading uh, and corroding. It doesn't really matter uh, in terms of the correlation, which says, you know, essentially that older bridges are typically less able to, to carry the load. They tend to be posted more. So age is a reasonably good proxy uh, for the ability of a bridge uh, to, to carry its load. So that's why uh, a histogram uh, of bridge age like we saw for Victoria is, is something that needs to be managed carefully as time moves on. Now, the UK have been through this where in the late 90s, um, to harmonize with Europe, they were increasing their um, general mass limit from 40 tons to 44 tons. And they went through a large a process of assessing bridges and upgrading or strengthening their bridges. And something that I think is, is particularly fantastic, and if you're not familiar with this work uh, by uh, Steve Denton, who many of you may know is from uh, the uh, European Committee uh, on, on uh, Codes, um, Steve did an audit um, of the bridge assessments that were conducted. And it's one of the only type of studies of its kind. What they did is they took 294 of the bridge assessments and they then went and audited those assessments, right? And they looked at why did the bridge fail uh, or why did the bridge pass? And was that a correct result for that bridge? And um, we can see that of these audited assessments, 31% were correct. 31%, right? A third of bridge assessments were correct. Two thirds were flawed. And that's incredible, but it's, it's what they found. Two thirds of bridges failed the assessment for an improper reason. Now, what the improper reason would, might be is the inappropriate use of standards, overly conservative assumptions, conservative or inappropriate analysis, uh, changes uh, in standards, and actually this one was mostly due to shear provisions. Um, but the biggest by far was this one here. Uh, sorry, my, my, my bad line. Uh, this one here, which was increased loading. So we have a lot of bridges failing assessments because of increased loading. Now, did the loads really increase or did the code just change? And should we be strengthening bridges to a code or should we be strengthening bridges to real loading? And so that was a key takeaway from this audit in the UK. So that's getting pretty motivating, I think, to begin to think about loading in a, in a bit more deeper uh, than simply uh, taking the code uh, notional load model as truth. So let's have a look then at bridge assessment uh, in Australia. I'm sure many of you are familiar with European practice or practice in your own country. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just introduce what we do in Australia and uh, you may find it interesting as a result. So in, bridge assessment in Australia is based on uh, a, a rating factor approach. Um, which is somewhat similar to the uh, American approach uh, in the AASHTO standard. And essentially a rating factor is the available capacity divided by uh, what you want to put on the bridge, uh, the, the vehicle that you want to give access to. Um, maybe it's the quad quad B double, uh, maybe it's a notional load model, um, but whatever you want. So uh, a number uh, gr greater than one uh, is good uh, and less than one is, is bad, right, on, on, on this scale. The available capacity is interesting because what it means is, is that we have the, um, the capacity minus, um, say, dead load, uh, minus um, superimposed dead load, uh, and so on, right? So it's, it's all of the loading that must be carried, but not the live load, okay? So that's the available capacity bit. 
so this is the, the, the essence of, of bridge assessment in Australia. Um, the flow chart in the code is, uh, you know, go out, collect some data, um, decide on the condition of the bridge, maybe do some measurements, um, and then do a capacity assessment. Now, what's quite interesting is, of course, rarely do these two things interact. Um, uh, Rade has uh, made some very good comments in his presentation about how uh, we can begin to uh, update bridge capacity on the basis of the observed uh, condition. Uh, and that's, I, I think, a, a really important area uh, for improvement. Uh, and Alfred presented some on that as well uh, a couple of weeks ago in his talk. Given then a capacity assessment, we have our load effects and load factors, uh, and then we put, put everything into this rating factor. Uh, and then if, if we're, uh, you know, uh, less than uh, one, um, the code just says to go to a higher tier assessment, uh, but if we're greater than one, uh, then we pass and, and there's no problems. This higher tier assessment had not been defined uh, in the code. So this was a, a little bit of a problem. Um, so we've recently completed a uh, report uh, which goes by this snappy title, uh, Ostrode's AP or 617-20. Um, so I'll just refer to it as our Ostrode's report um, from here on. This is the, the official uh, reference for, for this report. We extended uh, or, or we are proposing that we would extend the process in the code uh, from here um, to include these additional steps uh, where the data collection would be deeper than uh, the rating factor approach. Remember, this is higher tier. I'll, I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. We have uh, a capacity uncertainty uh, quantification we have a load effects quantification, and of course, this is what we're going to focus on uh, later on. Uh, and then we would conduct a reliability assessment um, and determine whether or not we had uh, adequate capacity. Now, one of the things that's quite uh, brilliant, I think, about higher tier assessment is that uh, it's not one thing. Um, it's many, many flavors of, of going to more and more depth. And so we can continue this loop until we uh, either decide to impose restrictions uh, or else we are happy with our assessments that, that the bridge is in fact safe uh, for the proposed loading. So a little bit more then on this approach. This is a something known as a probability-based bridge assessment. And uh, Alan O'Connor and uh, Ib N. Olsen uh, in Ramball, um, I think have a, a really excellent paper um, 2008, I think it's in the IABSA journal, and they show how this probability-based bridge assessment complements rather than conflicts with traditional bridge assessment processes. And I think this is really important for us as uh, academics when we want to talk to practitioners and we want to tell them that we have a good idea and we think we can help. Um, it's important that we're saying we're not throwing out the good practices that you already have. Instead, we're fitting in with the good practices you already have, and we're simply extending those or giving you more options. So a traditional process would be that uh, we, we assess using perhaps the rating factor, and if it passes, that's fine. If it doesn't, maybe we strengthen. Here we ask ourselves the question, uh, if it fails, we ask ourselves the question, is it worth spending consulting dollars, fees on consultants to do a deeper analysis? And if the road owner or the bridge owner decides that, look, this bridge is, is failing very badly, so it's not worth spending more money on consulting fees, I'll just strengthen, that's fine. But at least you've asked the question. A lot of times though, the, there will be an economic benefit to looking at a deeper analysis, especially if it's a bridge on a heavily trafficked route. And then we ask ourselves, then, then we go and do this deeper analysis. And of course, uh, if, if it passes, that's great. Um, but if it doesn't, we now have more information and we can do a what's called a probability-based strengthening project. And often uh, this is cheaper uh, than the traditional strengthening project because we have additional information that has come out of the probability-based assessment. So our proposal is a, a type of probability-based assessment 
um, and it complements existing uh, processes. And I think that that's a way that we hope it can get traction uh, with practice. We also made a big effort to relate the two approaches because it's important that consultants and bridge owners uh, can uh, understand what we're proposing and how it relates to what they're familiar with. So we produced plots like this, which have the traditional approach uh, here on, on the x-axis. And, and of course, in here, less than one is, 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 is unsafe uh, on, on the axis uh, we're familiar with. Uh, and, and over here is good on the axis that we're familiar with. On the, the y-axis, though, we have uh, annual reliability index. And this, of course, is the output of a probabilistic assessment. Uh, and the delineation between safe and unsafe is the uh, target reliability index. And that target may change depending on the limit state that you're looking at. Um, but needless to say, it separates what you call safe from unsafe. So we have this, uh, so here's our reliability unsafe and, and here's our reliability safe. And so now we have four quadrants where we have a region which, you know, both approaches are saying it's absolutely unsafe. Um, we have a region where both approaches are saying it's safe. Uh, but this is the region that's really good. This is the region where um, probability-based bridge assessment is going to give savings. This is the region where the traditional approach is saying it fails, but the uh, higher order assessment is saying it passes. And so this is where the benefit to bridge owners uh, exists. These dots are realizations um, from our analysis. These dots are realizations um, for particular bridges with particular types of traffic. Uh, and this comes from, from our study, uh, which, which is available, uh, and I can share a link later on. Um, and these are the bridges, of course, then that um, we can uh, justify as being safe uh, and justify as not requiring strengthening on the basis of this higher order assessment. So hopefully the, the benefits of this higher order assessment are clear, the motivation is clear, the benefits are clear. Um, so hopefully now that you're on board with, with, with us uh, and you can see the outputs, uh, let's, let's get into the, the load modeling, right? I'm not gonna talk about capacity modeling um, because uh, many other uh, presentations have looked at this, um, but, but concentrating on the load modeling then, I'll talk in the general uh, framework, which you may adopt for any country, and then I'll show you what we did for that study for Australia. I'll concentrate on short to medium uh, bridge lengths, and uh, I can explain a bit more about that maybe in the questions if, if, if we're interested in. Um, I'll also highlight that number, which is an unusual number, and I'll uh, see if anybody uh, wants to query that as well uh, as, as meet for a conversation later. Now, the overall process uh, is to collect some traffic data, and then you can really do this uh, or this. And I will concentrate on the simulation approach. Uh, and so I'll, now I'll just talk briefly about measuring the traffic load effects. Um, some uh, researchers will argue that it's better to measure them directly, uh, and, and it's, it's a very good point. Um, so we can measure them under traffic streams, perhaps for a few months, a year, maybe even two years. Uh, I think you can begin to see the problem there, uh, that data is limited. Um, extrapolation to long return periods is problematic. Uh, and equally, uh, it's difficult to relate a measured strain uh, back to what caused it, right? And it's really by understanding traffic and by understanding the traffic process that we can begin to understand better uh, the load effects that result from the phenomenon. And so maybe I'm biased, but uh, probably because I've spent so many years working in the simulation approach, but I, but I certainly think that simulation offers a, a complete top to bottom understanding of the phenomenon. And I, I think there's some scope in relating these two things to each other uh, in future, because there's certainly some positives to direct measurement. 
So we take traffic data, we simulate load events. I'll talk in detail about that. We then do some predictions, uh, which involves some statistics. We, we must account for dynamic interaction. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then the question often comes up, uh, should I consider free flow traffic with dynamics or should I consider uh, congested traffic, uh, traffic jams? And I'll talk about that. So traffic data is obtained from way in motion, full stop. Sometimes people talk about trying to infer uh, from static way bridges um, and, and use loop traffic counters, which are known as loops, loop detectors. Um, unfortunately, it, it just isn't good enough for the purposes of uh, bridge loading. There's lots of reasons why, but the, the main one is that static way bridges are, are, are very strongly biased. Um, if uh, a, a, a truck driver knows they are overloaded, they will not drive on a route that has a static way bridge. Uh, and so we have seen this from some studies in Europe uh, when uh, enforcement was in place uh, and we had a way in motion system. And then when enforcement uh, left, when, when the uh, police left for the evening, uh, we begin to see a spike in gross vehicle weights. So it's really important that we have unbiased vehicle data. And way in motion is a fantastic tool for this purpose. Um, there is a, a way in motion system here in the road pavement and you cannot see it. And this is the point um, that uh, drivers, freight operators will not know where way in motion systems are. And so it gives us unbiased real traffic data. Now, this was a special transport, obviously. Um, this uh, was a, a tank, a, a military vehicle being carried over the Westgate Bridge uh, in Melbourne. And the, uh, it is a pavement way in motion system on the orthotropic steel deck bridge, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's on the bridge. So it, sometimes people might think it's a bridge way in motion system. It isn't because the bridge way in motion systems use uh, the entire bridge uh, really to, to weigh the vehicle. Um, this is a pavement whim system with I think uh, two uh, piezoelectric sensors um, in the road. Um, and this is the kind of data that we get. Um, we obviously get the, the number of axles, we get the, the, the algorithm can classify the vehicle, we get the speed, the wheelbase, uh, the, the gross vehicle mass. Um, for fatigue or for pavement damage, we have the ESAL, the equivalent standard axle load. Um, uh, for, for bridges though, what we're interested in is, is this, right? We've got the axle spacings, and we've got the, the weights of each axle in kilograms. And that's the kind of data that we need for a uh, bridge assessment. So what we need are physical attributes of the traffic. Um, we need geometric attributes of so the number of axles, the axle spacings, um, and we need the arrivals, the timestamps, the gaps, the speed. And it's critical that we have reliable and accurate way in motion. So inaccurate way in motion is, is not so good. Um, uh, and there's a few systems that can drift with uh, uh, temperature, they can drift with um, soil moisture uh, and so on. And so they're not so good for us. Um, the algorithms that, so, so the way motion system is, is, as I say, it's a couple of centers in the road. Uh, and so it, it measures each axle, uh, but it doesn't measure a vehicle at once. And so there is an algorithm in WIM uh, called the concatenation algorithm, which joins together axles into individual vehicles. And we frequently see concatenation errors. Uh, that is, it, it, something with a large axle spacing, it might see as two vehicles, rather than the truth, which is it's one vehicle. So we have to be very careful. WIM cleaning is extremely important and not something to be taken lightly. And uh, certainly, you know, when I, when I look at some papers that are published uh, or, or review, um, this is something that's, that's quite important um, to, to, to point out. Photos of the vehicles are hugely beneficial for eliminating concatenation errors. Um, we frequently see timestamps uh, to one second because this is suitable for traffic engineering, but it's not good enough for bridge where small gaps are incredibly important for, uh, for bridge load effects. So a uh, hundredth of a second uh, is, is absolutely essential. We, we, we did try some systems at a 0.1 second, but the accuracy was not sufficient. 
so hundredth of a second. Um, all the lanes should be measured because that means we have a, an unbiased sample uh, rather than knowing that you know 20 percent of our trucks were in the outside lane which didn't have win uh, on the lane. Um, and quantity is important. Uh, in the past um, we had uh, very few uh, vehicles in our way in motion databases. Uh, the Eurocode um, in 1986 was calibrated on the basis of one week of data um, from a few different sites across, uh, across France, uh, from UK and Germany were compared, but there was a site in France that was deemed the most onerous, but it was one week. Um, we need far more, uh, and thankfully that's now uh, common. Uh, so big data approaches are becoming more relevant to way in motion than they were in the past. And so that's gonna be an exciting area of further work. What we took uh, for our Ostroads project uh, was uh, way of motion data from the way of motion uh, system I just showed on the Westgate Bridge, um, which is higher mass limit traffic. So that's up to about 68 tons. Um, we took six months from all 10 lanes of the bridge, uh, which came to about 3.2 million uh, trucks. And that is uh, defined as being greater than 4.5 tons uh, for this work. Uh, this is an important number to define as well um, for your individual purpose. This is the type of, of vehicles that we were looking at, the proportions, um, rigid truck or bus. So this is just a two axle truck. Uh, and then we're getting down to the, um, the B-doubles uh, that we see down here uh, on, on the uh, semi-trailers uh, that, that are also uh, towing so, uh, another one. So these are known as the uh, a truck with a dog trailer uh, sometimes. Um, so you can see that these have um, a substantial uh, contribution uh, to the uh, trucks that are being carried. So that's the data that uh, we had for our study. What do we do with that data? Um, and I've talked about the fact that simulation is, is but one of the approaches, but uh, within the simulation realm, um, it really revolves around the Monte Carlo simulation approach. Um, the full Monte Carlo approach is to characterize every single parameter that you can measure. Uh, axle weights, gross vehicle weight, axle spacing, the spacing between the first and second axle, the spacing between the second and third axle, and so on. Every single parameter should be statistically modeled, um, including any dependencies or correlations between them. Uh, so it's a, can become very, very detailed. Each uh, parameter, of course, has, uh, has a suitable statistical model. So a typical one for uh, gross vehicle weight might be uh, mixed Gaussian, uh, where uh, we, we, we see for uh, gross vehicle weight the, the, this typical bimodal uh, shape where we have uh, light or unloaded trucks, and then here we have the heavy uh, loaded, uh, fully loaded truck. So this is a typical shape of gross vehicle weight that we see, and that's well represented using a, mouse, a mixed uh, Gaussian. The critical thing here, though, uh, is uh, intra, inter and intra-lane dependencies. And what this means is that um, we often see heavier, slower trucks in uh, the inside lane and lighter uh, trucks on the outside lane. We often see for overtaking events that the uh, lighter truck in the outside lane um, is therefore correlated to a heavier truck on the inside lane. So the side-by-side uh, -side, um, trucks have a correlation there. Uh, and so it's, it's not, they're not completely independent. And this is quite tricky. Um, even worse, uh, the gaps. The gaps within the lane from truck to truck or truck to car and the gaps then between the lanes. So the front of the vehicle in, in lane one and the front of the vehicle in lane two. Uh, those gaps are very tricky and there's been some pretty impressive work done with uh, copulas to try to represent those in a full Monte Carlo statistical approach. Something that's emerging um, because of this difficulty with dependency um, is, is what I might call now a partial Monte Carlo approach. Uh, and I think it's fair to say this was led by um, Bernard Enright and Eugene O'Brien. Um, they introduced what they call scenario modeling, where they would take a measured uh, truck topology over perhaps 
two or three hundred meters of road and they would uh, <laughs> I'm using the non-technical word jiggle uh, they would um, manipulate those th they, they might change the the gaps just a little bit they might change the axle weights just a little bit they might change the vehicle weights just a little bit when you have enough way in motion data uh, and when you uh, have enough of these scenarios and when you then uh, jiggle enough of these scenarios you begin to uh, get towards an extreme and that's really really powerful so a, a lighter touch one is to use a randomized vehicle garage uh, with, with flow modeling and this is the approach that we took in our Ostros project. And um, I could use the technical term for this. Uh, statistically, this is known as, I'm, I'm quite intrigued by this name, but, but it's what it's known as in, in statistical literature. It's a smoothed bootstrap with a variable bandwidth normal kernel density uh, estimation. It's, it's a you know, terrific mouthful, but uh, it, it's quite straightforward as, as I'll show a little bit later. Some authors recommend using no Monte Carlo instead, just taking the measured vehicles, but putting them in the random order. Um, I have a problem with this in that I think you need a, a substantial quantity of way in motion data um, for this to be reasonable, because of course you uh, can only represent what you have measured. And, and that's a problem because if you uh, bias your sample in any way, those biases will be inherent in your predictions. I mentioned the flow modeling. Um, so it's not enough just to represent the trucks. You've got to also think about the traffic flow uh, and the composition, the proportions of each vehicle type is, is important, but it's critical that this is done on the basis of each hour. Okay, it must be done on an hourly basis because what we've found from a number of sites across the world is that the percentage of different types of trucks changes significantly uh, from day to nighttime. In particular, uh, at nighttime, we have a much larger percentage of trucks. Um, even though we have a smaller amount of traffic, uh, we have fewer cars, but the same amount of trucks then becomes uh, maybe 50, 60, 70% of the traffic stream. And that's a problem if you're going to cause a traffic jam because now your traffic jam is comprised mainly of trucks rather than of cars. So composition is really critical. Uh, for speed, um, where most people are happy enough to use a normal distribution for speed, um, you know, maybe it's somewhere around 25 meters a second with a normal distribution with standard deviation, maybe plus or minus, you know, two meters per second. Um, the critical thing here is that if you have a, a, a vehicle in front that's slow and a vehicle behind that's fast, uh, you don't want this gap in here to uh, close and, and, and overlap on the bridge. So the length of the bridge is really important for the relative speeds of these two trucks, right? So that's the critical thing uh, here. And that's the 70 meters I mentioned earlier. Uh, and I've said here, unless you're dr modeling driver behavior, which is a topic outside this presentation, uh, maybe for another day for long span bridges. So for short to medium span bridges, uh, one of the things we're interested in is, is the, the headway um, and the gap. And the diagram here, I'm trying to be very clear on what I mean by uh, headway and gap, because, uh, well, it's important to be clear about the terminology. Headway is the uh, time um, or, or distance measure from the front axle of one vehicle to the front axle of the following vehicle, whereas gap can sometimes be the bumper gap or sometimes it can be the axle gap. So, so please do interrogate your data or, or your presenters and ask them what they're talking about. This is challenging. Um, typical uh, traffic theory suggests that these are exponentially distributed. Uh, of course, this assigns a very large probability to very small gaps. And of course, that's not true. Uh, and so uh, an approach that has been used um, quite widely now, actually, um, is to represent the small headways, the, the cumulative distribution function of the measured small headways. Uh, and so we say small is, is less than four seconds uh, and just represent that using something simple like a quadratic curve, right? A, just an AX squared plus BX plus C. And it seems to work quite well we capture those small, uh, the probabilities of small gaps reasonably well. I've mentioned the hourly flow rates uh, and it's enough then to have the hourly flow rates uh, per lane and to use those alongside the compositions. Uh, so the flow modeling is 
a little bit involved, uh, not so straightforward, I guess, uh, uh, as well as the vehicle modeling. After that, we have to calculate load effects. R remember, at this point now, we only we, we have our traffic stream. Um, so calculation of load effects, reasonably straightforward. Um, the use of influence lines is quite widespread. Um, it's important, though, that we are thinking about the lateral behavior of the bridge. Uh, and so influence lines are typical. Uh, and where you have lane one, lane two uh, traffic streams, um, you want to be thinking about the, the influence of lane two on the component you're interested in and the influence of lane one on the component you're interested in. Sometimes um, it can, the influence line can be the same shape, and so you can just have a scaling factor, uh, which is a lateral distribution factor um, on the influence line, and that's great when you can do that. You can just multiply this by a number to get lane one and multiply it by a different number to get lane two. Um, and so that, that, that's good. Where you have more intricate uh, components that you're interested in, you, you probably want to be looking at an influence surface. And that's what I've represented here. This is a two-span integral bridge. Um, and I've got bending moment in one of the girders here, mid-span bending moment here. And this is the influence surface generated from a grillage analysis. And you can see that it's very uh, peaked. Uh, and also, uh, it's not a linear function. If I scale a slice through this influence surface on one wheel path, it's not quite a scaled version of uh, the other wheel path. And so, even thinking about the wheel paths and the peakness of the uh, influence line uh, or the influence surface is quite important. And so what I might do in, in this case is represent uh, this uh, lane, this influence surface with this blue dotted line here um, as being uh, a compromise between the two wheel paths for this. So a little bit of thought in the influence line is, is important as well. Now the project that we've just completed, uh, which uh, lo looked at Australia, um, where we had 3.2 million uh, vehicles in our way in motion uh, database, uh, we took a million of those vehicles and we we used uh, we used them in our in our garage, and the garage was um, randomly uniformly sampled from the measured vehicles, and so the you know, the measured proportion of each vehicle type was in that garage. Uh, and then what we did is we took each of these vehicles uh, and we, we, we put it through uh, a kernel, right? And the kernel, uh, for us, very, very simple, really. Uh, it, sometimes people use a triangular kernel. We use just normal distribution. Um, we took our measured vehicle and we uh, just simply manipulated the vehicle mass uh, with uh, an 8% coefficient of variation, um, the group axle groups with 5% and the axle group spacings with 2%. Right? And that was um, reasonably based on, on, on judgment, I guess, based on experience, based on the variability of the different uh, components of, of these vehicles. So this is a reasonably simple approach when you've got uh, substantial way of motion uh, data. What I particularly like about it is that correlations between axle group masses and gross vehicle masses are inherently accounted for. Uh, and they tend not to be broken down uh, by, by the small kernel uh, that, that we apply on it. Based on this garage, uh, we were able to then generate, you know, 100 years of traffic streams, right? With, with modern computation, uh, it's not so difficult. And so with this 100 years, we've crossed them over our influence lines. Um, we've used the uh, free flow headway model, uh, and we did this for two lanes, uh, both bi and unidirectional. And so we calculate our load effects um, using uh, our uh, grillage model. I shall show that in a minute. So we considered different flow profiles. Um, so we considered um, a very dense uh, flat profile, uh, which is this one here, uh, 25,000 vehicles per day with a a low demand in the nighttime, uh, and then a fairly uniform demand through the day. And this represents, you know, maybe interurban uh, type of site. If you're in a more urban area, you might see this type of shape um, of your traffic demand uh, on the bridge, where uh, the uh, you've got a morning rush hour. Uh, it tends to 
to reduce during the day and then an evening rush hour kicks in. Um, the percentage of trucks, um, you know, or, or the truck flow is a better measure, uh, can stay pretty uniform through the day. But as I mentioned earlier, the percentage of trucks here is significantly more than the percentage of trucks here. Uh, and then the last one was our total congestion. This was our very extreme uh, situation. Um, complete uh, um, saturation of the road capacity uh, with 3,000 vehicles per hour for two lanes. That's 1,500 vehicles per lane, um, which is very close to the highway capacity manuals um, limit for a mixed traffic stream type where we've got cars and trucks. So we studied different splits as well between the, the uh, uni direction, so 80% trucks in the slow lane, 20% in the fast lane, 50-50 um, split for the two lane uh, bi-directions and 50-50 split for the cars. So we ended up with six notional sites in total uh, that we represented um, in our traffic flow. On our influence surfaces then, we uh, had a lot of um, bridge decks that we were interested in. This is one of those uh, PSC, uh, the pre-stressed concrete eye girders that, that I showed a cross-section of earlier. Uh, and so we had a grillage model of this, the two lanes uh, on it, and then we passed this uh, one kilonewton bogey uh, across, uh, you know, lane one, uh, and look at the response at the, the location of interest down here, and we can then represent the uh, influence line, the measured, in a sense it's a measured or, or, or a grillage uh, defined influence line. Uh, and then we do the same for lane two. Um, we take that one kilonewton bogey uh, and we run it across lane two. Uh, and you can see the influence line uh, for lane two uh, is down there. So of course for this location, lane two does not have much effect. Uh, but, and what's, what's kind of interesting as well to note is, is, is it's not simply a scaled version of the lane one influence line. It must be a separate influence line. Uh, and these then must be added together um, when, you, when you've done the calculation for the total effect uh, at the point of interest. So now we have lots and lots of, uh, you know, bending moments and strains and shear forces uh, based on our Monte Carlo traffic streams and our grillage um, represented influence line. What do we do? Well, um, we, we want to predict uh, the extreme loading. Now, even though we've simulated 100 years of traffic, um, it's still important to do a statistical model of what you have looked at because um, the statistical distribution will interpolate better. It will smooth out the extreme because the next time I run my uh, model, the 100 year maximum, well, it'll be different. And the next time I run it again, it'll be different again. And the next time it'll run it, it'll be different again. And so fitting the statistical model, even when you've got a long, uh, a very long return period of, of traffic modeled or, or simulated, uh, it, it statistical, it helps to interpolate. Uh, so it's always worthwhile doing this uh, statistical modeling. So in the past, before we were able to do massive computation, we tended to be extrapolating from short simulations to thousand year return periods. But more, more, more and more today, we, we tend to be using the statistics to interpolate. Now we're always interested in this extreme data, the daily maximum, the weekly maximum, even the annual maximum. And so the, the, what, what has become the traditional approach now, uh, which um, really only came in in the the early 2000s was to use uh, extreme value theory, uh, to use the um, block maximum approach, which is GV, or peaks over thresholds, which is the GPD, the generalized Pareto distribution. So we, we've got our data, we've used an extreme value theory to fit the data to a statistical model, uh, and then we use that statistical model to tell us something about uh, what we're interested in, uh, the return level. Uh, so is that for, um, you know, 5% in 50 years? Is it for uh, the mean 75 year? Is it for the old uh, UK standard, which was a 2,400 year return period? So whatever output you're interested in, um, the statistical model will uh, do a good job of extrapolating or interpolating 
for that output. And look, something I'd encourage everybody to do uh, is, is uh, to use Gumbel probability paper because it uh, is particularly useful. Um, it accentuates uh, very large data. Um, so it focuses attention on the tail. Um, I've seen other probability papers being used, but they don't tend to scale the tail so well. And so the fits can be biased towards the mean. Um, so the, uh, I recommend Gumbel. Um, what is the Gumbel paper? Well, we take our, our probability density, we take the integral of it, which is a, a CDF, right? Um, which is characteristic S shape. Then we take the minus log minus log of the CDF and we get this lovely, uh, we, we get this lovely shape where attention can now focus in this upper tail uh, where we're interested in the extreme. When we plot it like that and- uh, Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but we are already in a limit. So I don't know if you want to accelerate or uh, uh, it's up to you, but we are in the limit, okay? Okay, thank you. I, I, yeah, I'm going too long. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll speed up. Um, the tail behavior uh, should be viable because the um, process should be limited uh, by physical uh, nature. So when we have all of our different loading event types, we can plot them all and fit them. Uh, and they uh, can be represented with this composite distribution because different numbers of trucks contribute different uh, amounts of uh, probability and amounts of loading uh, to, to the overall extreme. So we did this for our Ostroads project. We took the annual maximum load effects uh, and we extrapolated and, and this is our data and this is our fit and it, it was pretty good. We had um, IID, which is independent on identically distributed data. Uh, and so the fit was quite nice. The fit then can be used directly in the reliability assessment for the bridge that you're interested in. Lastly then on dynamic, or second last actually, on dynamic in, uh, interaction, um, the codes you'll probably know vary significantly. Uh, and you can see this from a, a sample of codes around the world. Uh, they all rep represent very different amounts of dynamic amplification. And uh, what we tend to see in the field is that dynamics uh, is, is reducing uh, hugely uh, as the uh, static, as the weight uh, goes up. So the heavier the load effect is, uh, dynamics tends to be much, much less. And so in recent times, we've been trying to capture this uh, by extrapolating the total uh, load effect to the return period uh, and comparing that with the extrapolated static uh, load effect. Uh, so this is the joining of extreme total loading with extreme static, and it's this um, ADR, we've called it this assessment dynamic ratio, that's, it's really the correct thing to link the uh, extreme total amount of effect with the extreme static. And what's interesting is it tends to be a lot less uh, than people have uh, looked at in the past. People sometimes talk about dynamics of 30 or 40%. We find it should be, you know, 5%. Uh, what we did uh, in our uh, project for Australia was uh, a reasonably conservative approach. We didn't go to that full bivariate extreme value modeling. Uh, instead, we took a model uh, for the DAF here, which was a, a GEV minimum uh, distribution, uh, where the at the extreme level it was one, at the low end, um, the daily slope is, is up around this 1.4 region. We took our distribution of live load from the statics and we used a correlation uh, coefficient to join the two things. So then we have realizations uh, of dynamic amplification and realizations of static load effect. But as you can see, the trend uh, is that as the load gets heavier, the dynamics reduces. The importance of this is for thinking about the governing form of traffic. When we think of free flow traffic with dynamics, um, it certainly governs for this uh, important region of bridges here, the short to medium span bridges in this area. Uh, previously, people have thought congested traffic then governs everything beyond that. Um, but that was based on this 20 or more percent dynamics. So when your dynamics is much less, when your dynamics is 5%, 
Um, all of these bridges now fall under congested traffic. And so that's a challenge uh, that we hadn't faced before, that we hadn't looked at. And so the better approach then is to combine free flow plus dynamics and congested flow traffic together into a composite distribution of traffic. And so it's neither congested flow nor free flow, but both, right? And so I recommend now with what I have learned that you represent or, or model both free flow and congested flow along with uh, a reasonable function to represent dynamic amplification. And what happens as, as illustrated in this case, neither free flow or congestion is critical. Instead, it's a combination of both that governs the extreme. You know, there's a 50% chance it might be the, the free flow, but there's a 50% chance it might be the congested flow. So I think in, increasingly both forms of traffic should be modeled. So to finish, and I apologize for going late, Jose, um, the main takeaways here, um, and it, this is a, a, li a little bit of a, a joke, I guess, for people who've been doing their reliability assessment where they've gone, oh, traffic, oh yes, I remember that, uh, bias 0.7, coefficient variation, 18%, uh, right? That's what I see time and time again, uh, please stop. <laughs> because it's far more than that. Um, increasingly traffic load modeling is, is the best chance for a big hit in assessment. We're not going to get much more out of resistance modeling. Uh, we are going to get more and more out of better load modeling, okay? That's where we're going to reduce uh, and make some savings. Uh, WIM is critical. Um, absolutely critical. So the first question should be to your owner, where's your WIM station? I need WIM. Um, after that, you can begin to get into questioning uh, dynamic amplifications. That's a key thing. Do not accept 0.4 or 0.3. It's madness, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, and I think what you've seen is, is probably reasonably complex, a bit too complex for day-to-day -day practice. And so I think the next step for us is to come up with some better user-friendly uh, model, better models than, than, than this one up here, right? But, uh, but, but, but more representative of what you've seen here today. Uh, and so hopefully we're, we're, we're going to uh, see if we can get a, uh, an appendix to the Joint Committee on Structural Safety um, code, uh, model probabilistic code. So um, hopefully that will be something we'll see in the future. Uh, and so, that's it. Uh, thank you to certain key people um, on the project team for the Ostroads, uh, Meyer Mellum in particular, uh, and to Andy Ng and Nick Hodgins in Department of Transport Victoria, who've been incredibly uh, formative in this work for Australia. So thank you all for uh, your kind attention and my apologies again for going so long in a topic that I'm quite passionate about. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. It, it, indeed, a very interesting and important, not only interesting, I think is, as you focused in the last slide, it's a very important topic because we are putting too much budget on the, on the resistance assessment and, uh, and uh, we can see here that many of the decisions and so on are connected also with the loading. If we don't know the loading, we cannot take right decisions as well. So um, again, I want to inform everybody that uh, those that are assisting us in Facebook, uh, you can place the questions on directly on Facebook. And those that are in Zoom, you should place the questions in the chat to the Aerostrike Association account. And um, I have already some questions uh, from the audience. And uh, the first question, or it's in fact two questions, from Aiki Lilia. And Aiki is asking, uh, Colin, how do you deal with loads in design standards in Australia for new and for the assessment? I believe you already touched some part of this, but mm. also what are the main difference between Australia system to the other ones from Europe and US? Well, that's a good question. And uh, Australia has, uh, a really unique approach to its design load model. Um, and I think other countries could learn from this. Um, I found it unusual coming from Europe, but the more I've studied it, uh, the, the more impressed I am with it. Um, it was based on an economic modeling of freight densities. 
uh, and so they looked at the uh, what, what, what's known as bulk density, um, and then uh, which is is things like um, you know toilet paper, right? So a, a truck full of toilet paper, it's volumetric, right? It's not um it's it's not heavy, it's just big, um, and they looked at those type of transports, and they also looked at then the uh, I think it's bulk. Sorry, I've, I've mixed them up where it's weight, right? So it, it may be that you're carrying, uh, you know, gold bars, right? Uh, so they're not big, but they're heavy. Um, and uh, the study, the economic study showed that the, the density uh, for Australia of this type of economic uh, activity uh, was about, uh, I think it was 0.75 uh, tons per cubic meter, right? Uh, and this is the, the cubic meter here is off the truck, right? And then when, you, when you're given the existing, uh, heights of the 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 the, uh, the road corridor um, so so the minimum heights and we know those numbers and when you've also got the minimum widths and you've got the turning radius uh, for the for the truck the turning radius um, governs the length of the vehicle the the height governs the height and the lane width governs the width so you now actually have a truck volume and you have a density and so now you know what mass you might look to carry in the future um, it, it, it's really quite a unique approach and uh, the result of that is a very heavy design load model. But of course, we know that at this point, it's quite cheap to include additional strength at the design stage. And so the reliability uh, indices being achieved by designs to the Australian standard are of the order of nine and 10. Uh, and I know that uh, people familiar with reliability indices where you're looking at you know, 3.75 or four, Numbers like nine and 10 seem crazy. Uh, but what's fantastic about the approach is that it's future proofing um, for uh, changes in, uh, allow in, in access limits, right? So, so politicians can have that freedom uh, to increase the, the, the allowable uh, vehicle weights. So it's a good approach. Um, for assessment though, as you've seen, it's very much about the particular types of vehicle that will be on that network. Thank you. Now it's time to Bate. Please. Yeah, I have uh, my own question. So my company issues permits uh, for all extreme loads uh, on road transport. And all, all permits that we issue, we have written then the speed over the bridge must remain below 40 kph. Now in reality, they're of course driving much faster. So does this increased speed affect the bridge safety or it's more or less okay? Thanks. Um, so, so this is where the uh, the dynamicists let's call it, let's let's call them the dynamicists. This is where the people who study vehicle bridge interaction will tell you that there will be some critical speeds where those vehicles can have very high dynamic amplifications, uh, and they're correct, right? That's possible. But what I would like to approach this problem is with a probabilistic viewpoint, and say, are those speeds probable? Um, and how probable are they? I'd also say, are there other trucks and vehicles on that bridge? And if so, are they destructively interfering with the dynamic excitation that's occurring under those permit vehicles? And I think when you begin to look at the problem from that point of view, the extreme total effect, which, which includes dynamics, is much, much less than the you know, 20, 30, 40% that people traditionally include uh, for dynamics. Um, that being said, uh, often bridges uh, are in uh, low points on, on a road because maybe they're co crossing a bridge, uh, sorry, a, a, a river. Uh, and so um, there is a, if you've got a very heavy permit load and it's coming down a hill, bottoming out on a bridge and then beginning to rise up the far side, um, it's pretty important that you don't bottom out uh, in a dynamic sense on the bridge. Uh, in that point. So I, I would be looking at the road and topology in, in, in the location um, for a detailed assessment. Otherwise, I would do what you're doing and be conservative and apply, you know, if it's a super, super load, a, a big load, five kilometers per hour walking pace across the bridge, uh, or as, as you're doing, probably not a super load, maybe something 100, 140 tons, 40 kilometers an hour is reasonable. Yeah. Thank you. Jose, back to you. Yeah. Colin, I have here uh, three questions. Uh, 
So the first one is uh, about overloading, overloading of permit vehicles, how they can be accounted. Second one is uh, something that you spoke at the end about the model error for the probabilistic traffic code models. How can these be estimated, the model error? And uh, from the models that you mentioned. And the last one, uh, I will put a bit change on this. The question is how can traffic growth be included in the traffic load model? But I want to change this because of the times that you are living today is how can the traffic adaptation be considered in the traffic load models? Because I'm not so sure that the traffic will grow or the vehicles will be somehow different from those that we are studying now. And we already discussed this before. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll take that last one first because um, I haven't, and if anybody's looked at my work, you'll see I haven't studied growth. And the reason I haven't studied growth is because I think the question is badly framed. Um, growth, uh, you know, saying that my traffic will grow by two or three percent per annum. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean that you will just have more of the same vehicles? Uh, and of course, we know from, from history, we know that that's not what happens. We know instead what happens is new vehicle types are introduced. And so this is called a modal shift, where instead of simply more of the same, you have something new, right? And I think that's what you're saying about adaptation, right? And that's the, that's the question. Um, what, what are the new vehicle types? that we should inject into the measured traffic streams that we have today in order to predict what the future might look like. And, and I think that that's an exciting area of, of research that needs to be done. I haven't touched it yet because uh, it's very difficult to try and predict what the new vehicle types are, right? Um, the uh, Australian approach, the, the, the economic density of freight, I, I think that's a tremendous approach and something that, that could be a basis for for what that adaptation of or, or new vehicle types might look like. Um, yeah, that's that's an important one. Uh, coming back to the first one then, the the overload versus the permit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really fond of saying uh, the bridge doesn't care, right? <laughs> the bridge doesn't care if it has a permit or not. Um, and, and, and that's true. Uh, but of course, it's important from the point of view of fatigue counting and so on that uh, the road owner would have track record of these extreme loads that are on it. Um, in terms of the way in motion measurements, of course, the way in motion data does not know whether it has a permit or not. Um, there has been some work done uh, by Eugene O'Brien's group to try to uh, extract permit vehicles from general traffic on the basis of what a typical permit vehicle looks like. But of course, it becomes problematic when you have illegally overloaded normal vehicles with a permit vehicle. But what is known is that permit vehicles tend to have a different configuration and they tend to have reasonably well-known axle masses. And so that's how they can be torn apart. Um, would I tear them apart? I would. And I would tear them apart because I can treat permit vehicles with a lower uncertainty. I, I know that the coefficient of variation on a permit vehicle is much lower than the coefficient of variation on, uh, on a regular uh, general access vehicle because they're much better controlled. Permit operators uh, know that their livelihood is at stake if they are pulled over and found to be in breach of their permit. Um, so we can rely on enforcement, I think, or the threat of enforcement uh, for that. You asked about model error. Um, I guess the answer here, and, and well, first of all, the answer is nobody knows because nobody's done it, um, which, which is exciting because that's further research. Um, I did touch on the fact that measuring load effects and comparing it to simulated load effects is something that could be done. And I think that's how we're going to answer the question of model error. And that hasn't been done yet. Um, we have got some data. Um, I, I did collaborate with Eugene Bruheiler. Uh, on uh, an instrumented bridge in Switzerland, um, but we never went as far as trying to quantify model error off that. But I think that that's what needs to be done because of the importance of this area of work. There is also, before, before going to Mate, uh, sorry Mate, 
the there is Ike Lida made a comment with respect to the the question about uh, the regulations about the model shift happens every time regulations are changed. So this is impossible to predict for next 50 or 100 years. And the regulation about legal limits of vehicles, of course. Yeah. And that's why I think it's crucial that bridge assessments are done assuming stationarity, right? So, so ignore growth, uh, which is why I've ignored growth, right? Ignore it and, and simply state to your bridge owner that uh, if you are going to allow different types of vehicles on this bridge, we have to come back and do another analysis. That this, this analysis is valid while the traffic stream stays as it is now. We can incorporate some increases in, in flow rates, but, but, but if you're going to change what's allowed on the bridge, we need to change our analysis. Mate, please. Um, I'll keep my questions uh, practical. So, um, Colin, how much uh, time does it take to uh, conduct a probability-based uh, bridge assessment? You know, is it uh, feasible for practice, you know, everyday practice, I mean? No, oh, that's, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, is it feasible for everyday practice? Uh, no, um, because I think it, it does rely on knowledgeable consultants uh, people who understand the fundamentals of reliability assessment, who understand the fundamentals maybe of what I've gone through here tonight in terms of the traffic modeling. Um, but that's not to say that there isn't scope for a certain sector of consultants to, to fill this space. Um, does it take long? Uh, no and yes. Uh, no, because um, perhaps a, perhaps only a small probability element needs to be introduced for the bridge to pass. Uh, and that's that first iteration on the PBBA that I mentioned earlier. And so maybe only representing the capacity with a probability model uh, and the load with, with even the, the famous uh, Gumbel distribution with a 18% coefficient of variation, um, you know, that can be enough to get a pass and that's fine. So, so that might take an afternoon, but if, if you're going to go to something more extreme like uh, the installation of a way in motion system uh, and the analysis, collection analysis of that data, um, that is, is going to take a long time, maybe a year, maybe even two years, right? Um, where that is valid though is for a, a, a very large bridge uh, or a, a particular route or, net or road that has multiple bridges that you're interested in um, upgrading uh, the allowable mass on those bridges. If that might, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have the same um, problems and the get data gathering is the thing that takes the most time. Um, but as I don't do probability-based uh, assessments, that that's the main reason I ask this question. Um, Jose, next one, yeah. of course. Uh, I'll make here a comment that uh, I guess if you know what it's doing, then it's quite straightforward, with which I fully agree. <laughs> and, uh, and now I have here another question from uh, Armoni Top. Uh, in fact, there are two questions. The first one is which is more significant in modeling of long span bridges, if it is a free flow or congestion. I believe you already told a bit about that. And the second question, which is quite interesting, uh, I will make here a bit change on this question. He asks, he's asking about if there are alternatives to weight emotions, especially for studies in poor countries. I must say that it's not only in poor countries. I think in many countries, is there any cheap or low cost uh, system that we can use as an alternative, alternative to weight emotions? like using uh, wavees or other systems, I don't know, implemented cameras, uh, because the fact is that, is that uh, uh, the wave motion still has a, a cost and, uh, and uh, what is the cost benefit analysis at the end? And this comes with another question, just to finalize, about the using of new technologies uh, on uh, the loading on vulnerable bridges 
being managed? How can you use these technologies? Uh, all right. So, yeah, long, long span bridges um, definitely congested. Uh, congested traffic is is critical. Um, why I hesitate though is because um, you, if you're familiar with 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 long span bridge loading, what what people do is they will put a conge a, a completely congested bit of traffic on on the adverse part of the influence line, and they will completely unload the uh, beneficial part of the influence line, right? It's as if, oh, well, the traffic never went there, right? And, and of course, that's that's deeply flawed, right? <laughs> um, and, and so what, what, why I hesitate is, is because um, so some recent work I did, uh, we, we think what, what's actually a good model to, to look at the, the fact that there is traffic on that beneficial part of the influence line is to put a free flow representation of traffic on the beneficial part of the influence line and to put the congested traffic on the adverse part of the influence line. And why that is reasonable is because of, uh, and we've all experienced this, uh, stop and go traffic. When you, you, you know this, you're stopped for a while, then you speed up and then you're stopped for a while again, right? So that type of traffic can pattern itself on a long span bridge uh, in that mode that I, that I mentioned. So certainly, look, 99%, yeah, congested traffic. But if you want to go to that extra, nth degree of, 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 of depth on this, you may decide to put free flow model on the beneficial part of the influence line. The uh, alternative to WIM, and I guess this is also new technology. Um, first of all, the, there is no alternative to WIM. Uh, but second, if there was to be an alternative to WIM, uh, it's based on WIM. And uh, <laughs> what I mean by that is that if, if you have a, a WIM site in your region, and you can correlate it with some other measures which are cheaper, and you can have those other measures in other locations, then you can have a pseudo whim uh, at those other locations, right? Um, but at the end of the day, it has to be whim. <laughs> there's just, there's no getting away from it. It's, it's the core uh, data piece for this type of work. Um, but if we are to get away from it, um, if we are to get away from it, we can use cameras, uh, we can use anything that uh, can identify a vehicle configuration, which can then be back uh, compared with a database of similar such vehicles. Um, the model error in this type of approach would be far greater than an accurate and quality win at the site of interest, but it's definitely feasible for wide geographic areas where you've only got three or four WIM sites. Uh, and so that's what I'd encourage people to do there. Cameras are going to be a key part of that, but loop detectors are, are quite good for that too. And in terms then broadening that new technology question, um, look, I don't see why uh, bridges won't be talking to trucks in the future. I don't see why the, the driver or the robot that's in the truck uh, won't be getting a signal from the bridge to say, you need to be spaced 50 meters apart to cross me. Um, and if you, uh, uh, don't maintain this 50 meter gap to the vehicle in front. Um, I have your registration and you will be fined. Um, and what that will do, uh, even though it, it, uh, it doesn't sound like much, it actually shifts the mean. And by shifting the mean, we, we have a big influence on the tail uh, that we need to assess those uh, extremes for. So uh, I've done a little bit of work on this uh, bridge to vehicle communication um, or uh, where it's going to become really important is for automated truck platooning um, because we need the bridge to signal to those automated trucks uh, that they need to separate when they come to one of our uh, critical uh, heritage bridges that we are trying to keep operational. Um, the idea, uh, and, and I know a lot of tech people are, are, are really keen on this, but the idea that we're going to have these fleets of uh, closely spaced uh, automated trucks traversing our 60 year old highway network is, is just flawed, right? Um, it's not gonna work until we embed uh, uh, into it um, the management and, and, and operation of these existing bridges. Thank you, Mate. Um, how are we with time, Jose? Uh, you question or? One question, I make another one and then you finalize. Okay, so let's see. Um, the question could be 
uh, when does the free flow traffic uh, with dynamic stop being critical load, uh, the critical load case and uh, congestion traffic should be modeled? That's, that's the famous question. Uh, and, um, I'm, I've tried to answer it at the end in, in, in terms of saying, uh, well, I, I now think, uh, and I've, this is only in the last few years, but I now think we need to model both because I've found for different load effects, uh, for different spans, uh, for different representations of dynamic increment, uh, it can be any, any of them. And it can even be a mix. The extreme can be governed by a mix of both of them. And so more and more, I think it has to be both. Uh, and where I would say both is, is for spans greater than about 20 meters because 20 meters is one truck, right? Um, if you can only get one truck on the bridge, it doesn't matter whether it's congested or not. Um, but as soon as you can begin to have multiple vehicles on that bridge, uh, then congested traffic uh, can be a critical load case for that bridge. Colin, I have here uh, two questions. One is uh, you mentioned some procedures that are being implemented and proposed uh, simplification procedures for the probabilistic based bridge assessment. Uh, would it be feasible to include the way motion data and some of the traffic modeling that you are uh, presenting in these simplification um, procedures? This is the first question. And the other question that I want to ask you, but I don't know if you can, if you have any information about, but what about railway bridges? Because you spoke about the dynamic application factors. You spoke about uh, a lot about roadway bridges, but uh, what about railway bridges? Is there uh, any more advances compared with the roadway bridges? Is it more easy, the, the distributions are more uh, accurate? To more precise, what is your feeling about it? Well, I should say first, I, I'm not an expert on on uh, railway bridge loading, um, I, not having studied it in, in detail. But uh, I, I do know from from discussions with colleagues that yes, it, it is more certain. Um, the uh, it depends on the types of vehicles, but if if it's a, a bull carrier. Um, they tend to be loading the wagons and they're measuring the weight of, of what they're loading. Uh, and so while their individual axle weights may not be perfect, they're, they're usually pretty good. So the coefficients of variation are, are much lower for, for railway. Um, dynamics, though, is, is the key thing. And there are a lot more, um, I think, sources of excitation and damping uh, in, in railway bridges with ballast. Um, depends on the track type, uh, the age of the track um, uh, as well. So. Um, dynamics, I would say, is probably, mm, is it even more important but, uh, than it is for roads? But uh, I guess our understanding of its importance for roads is, is, is evolving and we now think it's less important than it was because our understanding of, of its influence at the extreme is now better. Um, I think something similar possibly applies for railway. Um, the, I, th I think, to, to, to be blunt, I think the flaw in some of the research in dynamics has been the uh, excess concentration on the high levels of dynamics rather than concentration on dynamics at high static levels, right? Which is a different question. Uh, and uh, I think if we looked at railways from that point of view, we may see some changes to, to what is, is, is known right now. The question about how can simpler or, or you know a, a, a guidance code um, you know su such as the um, probabilistic model code how can that how could that model or represent traffic um, is a really key question uh, I don't really have a good answer to that the best answer right now I think is the Danish road directorates um, guidance on probability based assessment um, where they for a certain few types of bridges. They recommend um, one or two trucks side by side or, or nose to tail. Uh, they recommend a probability model for gap. They recommend probability model for the gross vehicle weight. Um, but it's a, it's a fairly limited and simplified representation. Um, the role of WIM in that 
type would be, I think, to reduce the model error that we would have to put on top of a simplified traffic model. So uh, I think you could expect to see a model error of at least 10% coefficient of variation on a simplified traffic model. But I think we would be looking to allow people to reduce that to perhaps three or 5% on the basis of uh, way in motion uh, data uh, generating the, the model uh, to be put onto a particular bridge. Many thanks, Mate. Last question. Okay, last question. You already mentioned, uh, Colin, um, interaction between trucks and bridges in the future. Um, so this is like some kind of future technology, let's say, in 10 years. Um, seems interesting, but um, my question would be regarding the vulnerable bridges. Could they also have some technology built in to let you know, the, the traffic know how should they, let's say, behave? You know, you elaborate maybe a bit on that for the next, I don't know, decade. What could happen? Yeah, the the idea of the bridge communicating to the trucks is is is, is neat, but it, it needs to be wrapped up in a, in a structural health monitoring system and a, um, a you know an overview where um, not only are we hoping that loading is is reduced to an acceptable level, but that we're managing that we're we're, we're observing and managing that that's the case. Of course, with 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 uh, GPS. Um, it, it's probably enough for automated truck platoons to simply download a, you know, a map, um, which would have bridge information tagged in that map. Uh, and, and the uh, road network operator would have said, you know, this bridge can only have one truck at a time uh, and so on. And, and those automated truck platoons, they probably wouldn't need to speak to the bridge. Instead, they would simply be going by their guidance system, uh, which is saying, hey, this bridge coming up is critical, let's slow down or, um, whatever it needs to be. Um, so maybe the bridge doesn't need to talk to the vehicles. Uh, perhaps a better phrase would be, uh, you know, a bridge aware uh, vehicle, right? <laughs> um, and in terms of overall traffic, um, what I, I, we, we did, we, we wrote a paper where we looked at this gap control between trucks. And what was interesting was it, it had no effect on congestion uh, because it didn't really matter whether congestion occurred a little bit after the bridge or a little bit before the bridge the throughput, the, the flow rate was the same, but it mattered significantly to the bridge whether or not there was congestion on the bridge or whether there was free flow, widely spaced trucks on the bridge. And uh, that was kind of interesting because the concern about this idea had been, well, you're gonna cause congestion um, and you know, people will be annoyed and politicians will, will get upset and, and, and want the bridge strengthened, but uh, um, we think that there's actually no effect uh, in, in terms of flow rate. There's only a beneficial effect uh, in terms of the loading that's on the bridge. And even better, uh, it doesn't require all trucks to have this system. It doesn't require all trucks to be bridge aware. It, it only requires about 50% of trucks to be bridge aware to have a noticeable effect at the extreme, which is great. Thank you very much. So now we come to an end of this talk. I want to acknowledge uh, first Colin for this quite interesting presentation and discussion. And uh, now I give you freedom to go to bed and rest a bit uh, because it might be hours to go to bed in Australia now. And uh, but it was fantastic and, uh, and also when we recognize the passion that you have on this topic <laughs> and uh, the need that now we, we, we need more and more with this adaptation and so on, we need more and more to, to study this topic. Uh, I also like to acknowledge Mate for being with me today. It is a pleasure to, to see you and, and uh, use this opportunity to see each other uh, in the talks. And uh, finally, I also want to, to acknowledge all that are here with us in this talk. And before uh, turning off this, uh, this uh, live talk, I want to give you some brief information about our associate partners. So 
concerning IAPS, uh, I want to mention that the uh, first IAPS uh, online conference will run from the 2nd to the 3rd of September 2020. And uh, that the call for abstracts for the IAPS symposium in Ghent is now open. It will be from the 22nd to 24th of September next year. From FIB, I want to inform you that in response to the current circumstances, the organizing committee of FIB PhD Symposium in Paris decided to hold an online PhD Symposium from 26 to 28 August 2020. So this is for PhD students and an in-person symposium on the from the 21 to the 23 of July 2021 in Paris, France. The participation of, on online symposium is free, but the registration is mandatory. Also from FIB, I want to mention that the symposium in 2020 in Shanghai will be now fully online and will run from the 22nd to, 20, to the 24th of November 2020, this year. With respect to Eurostruct, I want to mention that the Eurostruct training course will be online from the 2nd to the 4th of September 2020. We are almost achieving a limit of registrations, but if you want to make your registration or any of your student or collaborator, you'll be able to do it until the mid of August, 15th of August, I believe. So please hurry because the number is getting full. Also from Eurostruct, the Eurostruct 2021 conference will be held in Padova in Italy from the 29th to the 31st of August 2021 and a call for abstracts will be launched very soon. We also finalize here this slot of Eurostruct live talks, these 12 slots, these 12 uh, talks and uh, all of you are able to see all of them at any time on the Eurostruct YouTube channel. So all these talks will be provided uh, on the Eurostruct YouTube channel. And uh, of course here in the name of Colin, our last speaker from this slot of 12 talks, I want to uh, acknowledge all the speakers and all moderators that were with us during this period. Also, I want to mention that the Eurostruct survey about critical infrastructures on pandemic times will be open in Facebook for those that want to, 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 to fill in this survey. I invite you to do that. And finally, I invite you also to become a Eurostruct member, you or your institution. You can do that on our website. And uh, in our next slot of talks and in our next training courses and conference, you're gonna have a special uh, prices. And also if you become a member, you're gonna have access to some of our uh, data and some of our reports that we are uh, working on within the Eurostruct. Uh, finally, just to mention that soon there will be a new task group that will be launched within Eurostruct. And of course, you are all invited, you will receive news about it. You are all invited to participate in this task group. So again, thank you very much. And I wish you all the best to you and your relatives. And see you soon in our next slot of uh, live talks, probably by the end of this year. Bye bye and thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Mate. Bye, Jose. Bye, Mate. Thank you.